Welcome to the Who Knows This podcast, where I track down in the trenches experts to answer questions that we all want the answers to. I'm Sam Visnick, and I'm a veteran and working with people with chronic aches and pains by the way of massage therapy, exercise, pain education, hypnotherapy, and lifestyle education. Today, we're going to talk with physical therapist Zach Couples about his unique approach to improving movement and reducing pain. So let's get started. Hey, and welcome, and I just want to do a quick introduction to the guest that is coming up. Zach Couples is a graduate from St. Ambrose University. He is a doctor of physical therapy, having graduated in 2011, and he completed an orthopedic residency as a certified strength and conditioning coach and has spent the bulk of his career studying and becoming certified in many various lines of thought, including Posture Restoration Institute, FMS, SFMA, dry needling, precision nutrition, and he is a certified speed and agility coach and many additional certifications. So he's got a long list and I'm very excited to have him on the show to talk a lot more about his approach. So now you know who my guest is, let's get into it. All right, everybody, so welcome. And uh, I've got a great guest today, Mr. Zachary Couples. And um, we talked in the beginning about the extensive history and um, things that you've done. I just wanna reiterate that uh, how I had stumbled upon you actually was I was doing uh, internet Google research on uh, different types of topics in particular. Uh, I have talked about this multiple times and we'll, we'll cover this again, postural restoration and a lot of other type of movement systems out there. And I came across uh, Zach's website, and I was blown away. I, sp I probably spent a couple of hours on your website just, and this was a couple of years ago, just because of extensive reviews of the courses. And I found them not to be so much fanboyish. I mean, they were really good, good, you know, neutral reviews, and you had done so many different types of systems. Those of you out there who are listening, we know that like there's so many acronym systems now. You know, you could take three letters and then develop a system out of it. So there's so much out there. Some of them have conflicting information, I should say a good amount of them. So it's really hard to come across somebody who number one has uh, done many of them and has integrated them in the way that, that Zach has. So I think that's a, a real um, huge bonus to having you here to talk about some of these things and get your input on, uh, especially as a clinician, as a physical therapist and having done some of these systems and then working in the field as long as you have, kind of like what your experience has been and, and what's been working for you. So first of all, I just wanted to throw that out there um, so that people understand where you're coming from and how valuable this conversation is going to be. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you so much for having me, Sam. And I, uh, I'm flattered that you spent so much time on my website. Um, it, the negative that I found by taking all those courses in the beginning is it makes it really tough to find stuff to take to keep my CEUs up now. But, you know, it was it was worth uh, the endeavor. I'm sure that there's plenty of droll PT uh, CEUs and continuing education courses that you can take now, which will bore the life out of you, you know, so it may not contribute to your evolution. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is the sad truth. So let's take a moment here and just chat about your, your beginnings here. So obviously you became a physical therapist and, um, you know, let's talk about how you, you started off and getting such an eclectic kind of knowledge base uh, going after these certs. Where were you starting from? Yeah, so I um, I was very fortunate to spend one of my clinical affiliations with Bill Hartman, who's a mentor to me to this day. He's a he's a big pioneer in the field. If you haven't heard of him, um, definitely look look into him. Um, but people who have spent time learning from him and just the um, environment that he creates and, and the people that gravitate towards him, um, all of us pursue excellence in our field to some degree, and so. I'm a competitive guy that caters a bit to my competitive nature. And I also felt like I was not that good um, in the beginning, for sure. Especially when I just look at some of my peers, it's like, wow, these guys are brilliant. What, what am I doing here? And so I think some of it was was bent out of old insecurities that I had. And so I just wanted to learn literally everything I could to be the best clinician that I could so I could help people. And so that took me to a, a bunch of different things It took me to uh, you know, I spent a lot of time learning PRI. I learned um, some stuff from DNS, SM, SFMA, FMS, um, a lot of like the NOI groups, so explain pain, things like that, which was you know more more neurodynamics. Um, I mean, dermo neuromodulate, like anything that you've 
probably heard of in manual therapy or physical therapy. I've probably taken it or am at least familiar with it. And it was just a matter of I, I needed a bigger skill set to help my clients. And so I would take this stuff, apply whatever I could to see what would work and what didn't. And then that just has refined my process over the years to what I'm doing now, which is, um, well, the model that I teach, human matrix. And um, it, it, that's kind of been an amalgamation of what's been useful and not, and then just, um, you know, built off of some of the practical experience that I've accumulated over the years. And so those of you real quick who are listening, who hear all these acronyms being thrown out, these are all just different types of systems in which uh, different types of therapists, whether or not that's, you know, physio, chiro, you know, massage therapists and so forth would take um, outside of like just a traditional schooling path. So I think most of us out there, this is just kind of the known, but I'll throw that out there anyway. Big divide in the industry is, let's say, physical therapy in particular as the kind of like high volume model, right? Going in and people just get thrown through the therapy grinder and PT, get a cookie cutter sheet of exercises, TENS units, all this kind of stuff. And those that are more interested in understanding deeper levels of how orthopedic dysfunction and movement and pain and so forth, how to alleviate these things. And so there's definitely a bunch of different paths to take. And um, those are some of the things that Zach has done, which has taken not only uh, learning how the entire system moves, but also how that interrelates with things like pain. And not a lot of people are familiar with this. I hope we dive into this a little bit, that things like posture and movement do not have a strong, strong correlation to pain. I mean, obviously there's, you know, uh, tying in relationships, but it's not that clean. And that's why practitioners have to study a lot of different things uh, to try to figure out what works for the individual. So um, that's kind of part of all of that training, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you, you, especially learning a lot of just the way pain works, you realize that there's a lot of fundamental assumptions in our field that just aren't true. And so you have to all offer an alternative explanation, one, to make sure that you're not spreading misinformation to patients, because a lot of times that can be maladaptive. That leads to fear avoidance. That leads to pain catastrophization, which those are both associated with worse outcomes in the long run. But then if our conventional methods are flawed and the reasoning behind it, we also have to find other ways to still help people. And, and that's where I think spending a lot of time learning outside of what you're taught in school or what conventional approaches are is useful. And otherwise, too, you have to, you have to be able to differentiate yourself to get better outcomes. Because like you said, um, if, you, if you're working in a physical therapy mill, you're, you're running a volume game and it's really hard to get good outcomes there. And it's not the fault of the practitioner. A lot of times it's the fault of the system. And so your options are either try to do what you can in the system or go outside of the system. And so if you can spend the investment, the time, the energy to build your skill set, then that can allow you to create a, a, an environment outside of conventional methods that will, you know, hopefully allow you to help people. Yeah. And just to, Back up on that point, I think that, uh, and, and I've been in a high volume PT practice very early on in my career and saw how that worked. And and I think that there's a huge problem right now because, it, and people wonder where I get most of my information from, and largely it's from physical therapy uh, fields, which is fantastic, produces lots of great information, but the problem is kind of getting what's, what's evidence-based into actual daily practice at most of these types of PT clinics. And I find that that's just not really happening. So if if everything is moving toward a more evidence base, but yet um, and we're still using tens units and you know this kind of stuff in in practice and, and cookie cutter exercise programs, people aren't getting what the evidence shows. So that's unfortunate that people. How many people I see say I've been to PT. I've been to four different PT clinics. PT doesn't work, and I'm like PT works. What you have done has not worked because that's not currently what's available to us. So I'm sure that you've seen this hugely and it's a common problem, which is people think that movement work does not help them and they just haven't gotten good movement work. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, um, I forget who said this. I think it was, uh, God, I can't think of the guy's name, but, um, if you have one bad experience at a restaurant, you don't swear off all restaurants. <laughs> and so I think the same thing is true with physical therapy. Just because one physical therapy 
um, you know, appointment that you went to or a physical therapist that you worked with didn't help you. It doesn't mean that another one can't because we're not all the same. Even those of us who work in private practice, that's maybe cash pay or outside of the conventional system, we all operate slightly differently. We all have our different biases, uh, our approaches, so on and so forth, and the people who we who we do best with. And so it's it's not a, a one size fits all approach by any means. Yeah, absolutely. And so let's move on to a topic of kind of like progressing that with out of all these different systems that you've done, um, if you were to kind of over give us a, a a big picture of what you have kind of generally found to work and what your favorites are, uh, how would you go about talking about that? Yeah, well, I think what I've learned is all systems have their inherent flaws in terms of what's um, useful and what's not. I, I would say the person who has probably put things together the best is Bill Hartman, and he's he's been a uh, a big proponent of of what I do, <clears throat> or not proponent, but influence, I should say. And basically, y- you have to look at what the common principles are among all these systems. Well, if we're dealing with movement, and that's not going to be different because that's basically like basic anatomy, kinesiology, so on and so forth, then we need to figure out what movement is. And so the assumption that I operate from is that movement works very similarly to fluid dynamics because we are mostly made of water, right? I think it's 90 some percent. Well, actually it depends on your age, but anyways, um, it's a significant amount. And so if we understand how fluids work and move, then we can understand how movement works. And then the, the, the methods that you use don't really matter. You just apply based on this principle. And so the way fluids move is if I apply pressure in a given area, say a muscle contraction, fluid is going to move away from where that pressure is applied. And that's what allows movement to happen. So if we use my arm as an example, if I flex my elbow, I am applying pressure on the front side of the joint because of these meaty biceps that I got, Sam. And that pushes synovial fluid back to the posterior, the backside of the elbow joint, stuff on the back stretches. And that's how movement happens. And that concept happens everywhere. It happens all the joints, but it also happens at things that aren't conventionally joints. So when you bend forward to touch your toes, your abdominal contents have to move backwards in order for you to move forward. For example, if you're someone who's got a lot of central adiposity or belly fat, and I actually did this unintentionally, this experiment myself, because I gained like 30 pounds in one summer. Um, <laughs> It's much harder to touch your toes because you can't literally move the viscera out of the way. Um, The same thing is true in the lungs. So you have to be able to move air to various portions of the lungs in order to move as well. Same thing. If I touch my toes, I have to be able to move more air towards my backside and less to my front side. Otherwise, I'm not going to create much movement through the rib cage. And so if you have that thought process in mind and you can look at where people's movement deficiencies are, you can really choose any exercise from any system or any manual technique from any system, applying that principle to the movement of fluids. So if I have to move fluid out of an area, I'm going to use contraction-based stuff to do that. So that can be exercise, but that could also be more aggressive manual therapies that perhaps increase um, tissue stiffness. And sometimes that's useful. Um, if If I'm trying to reduce muscle activity in an area in order to illustrate movement that might be more of your low effort exercises whether that's tai chi whether that's feldenkrais whether it's anything like that or on a manual side it could be very light effleurage or very gentle um, touch so once you have that that movement model and that principle that you operate from the the other systems don't really matter you just take whatever it is that gets you the outcome that you want. And then you're just measuring whatever is meaningful to uh, help your decision-making. And so um, changing my framework to that has allowed me to integrate pretty much everything that I've learned without necessarily putting any stake in any one system more so than others. So that's really interesting. And that's firing off a few things for me as predominantly, I would say my, my second career, ultimately first is fitness. Uh, second is a massage therapist. 
most of my miracle successes in the course of I've been at this for about 20 years now has been things that people walk in the door with. And I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to help you with this and doing neuromuscular therapy, which is just a thorough uh, uh, massage for any in individual area and making things better just by pumping blood. And of course, you know, people that's short lived. So you have to figure out a way to get people to go home and get the same outcome. And I was always a proponent of um, um, Ola Grimsby. I don't know if you're familiar with him. And Ola Grimsby medical exercise therapy was uh, a lot of intro level exercises for areas where high repetitive pumping, very low intensity, less than 30%, 40% of one rep max. And it was done for two minutes of repetitive movement. And I found that it was so beneficial for people. And I talked to PTs and I'd say, you know, I do high repetitive pumping to sedate muscles and to get them uh, to reduce pain. And he said, there's no evidence for that. Why would you do that? And I'm like, well, it works. So there has to be some principle by which it happens. You know, it's low intensity, so it doesn't cause threat, you know, so that's gonna obviously improve things, but fluid dynamics, that makes perfect sense. So we're moving things around. So that becomes a kind of a different lens or framework to go into that discussion of saying everybody's still in 2023, I find it bizarre, this obsession with static posture on where you're supposed to be in space and just having to be in one location and you know we're still having these these internet videos going around i think every single day about saying hey you have too much anterior pelvic tilt that's causing all my problems and it's, it's so limited but how do you take that concept of uh what you're talking about with fluid dynamics and the importance of getting things moving and kind of bridge the gap between people's understanding of like your posture is causing your problems with that and and progress the the understanding into something that can that can help people kind of advance their knowledge. Well, it's, it's funny because I, as you're saying, literally those two things. I have a couple of videos coming out that are <laughs> on that. Um, I hope so. But but also I'm framing it differently. Yeah. Um, so the thing with um, the, the the assumption that we need to dispel is that we are static in general. When you're standing and you're not moving, you're still moving. There's a little bit of sway that your body has so you can not fall over. We're kind of like skyscrapers in that sense. Like you see a skyscraper and wow, this is a massive structure. But it has a, a little bit of built-in movement within it so it can tolerate um, very strong winds. And so that way it doesn't topple over. Even when you're sitting, you're, there's still movement going on at all times your heart is beating. That's causing fluid to move throughout your body. You're digesting, you're breathing. Every time you breathe, your body has to move to make room for air and then evacuate that air. So there's no such thing as a static person until you're dead. So with that in mind, the problem becomes if I don't have the ability to express the most of that movement that's available. So the, the problem isn't one static posture. Well, actually the problem is one static posture because if that's the only thing that you have, that's going to increase loading into specific areas and that can cause problems. Even if it's what we have you know, culturally decided is the best posture. Well, if you're sitting with a nice arch in your back, your shoulders are pulled back, your chest is, or your uh, chin is tucked in, if you hold that for six hours straight, you're going to get uncomfortable. The problem is not how, how you visually appear. The problem is, is that you can't assume multiple positions to, in order to do the things that you need to do. Even in the thing of sitting, the best sitting posture is one that's constantly changing. So can you sit slouch? Can you sit arch? Can you sit on one side? Can you sit on the other? It needs to be an active process. And that's what they're advocating for in the research. There was a study I read recently where they said healthy, I think it was like the, I'm paraphrasing, but it's like healthy sitting posture must be considered an active process, not a static one. And I think that's true of everything. Um, I think what's, what I think also is difficult for people, especially with things like anterior pelvic tilt and things like that is we have decided as a, as a society that some of this stuff is not um, aesthetically pleasing. And, and that's a really tough thing for people to get past. But the way you would even make any adaptations on that front 
is to make sure that you have your body has all of its movement capabilities available so that's not all that you have and and so that's really been my biggest focus for people is to get them movement that they lack so that way they have more options available at their disposal to move that's great great point and one of the things that i had I, over the years had noticed with people is that um and had told them because they'd come in and they say i'm, I'm afraid that i'm going to uh, get degenerative conditions as a result of my posture and so forth. And I remind them, I say, even if you get perfect posture, you're going to degenerate in that position. So it doesn't, you're going to fall apart no matter what. The problem is, is that you've got to be able to get in and out of that position. And, and for me, one of the, a lot of the systems and what I used to like when I first learned this work was all about static posture, right? But now it's more about, I don't care if you slouch, I care if you can get out of it. And then I care about how long you can stay out of it, because if you don't have endurance, you're going, you're not going to last long before you go right back to that position again. So you've got to be able to have not only be able to move, but also be able to have some endurance, some fitness, right? We see bodybuilders who have really tremendous amounts of forward head posture, for example. And, you know, everybody has, we can make the discussion or the argument how many have pain who don't. But they seem to have far more tolerance because they have a big hulking amount of trap mass on the back of their neck. So they probably have a blood pump in there just going like this all the time, right? So there's less, they have more uh, tolerance to fatigue. So I think, uh, and that is the other thing, especially in the fitness field, there's so many arguments around this kind of stuff as well, that people in fitness get away with a lot more because they have more fitness. So they can tolerate more movement dysfunction or postural dysfunction it appears right would you agree with that yes and no i think i i will agree with they can definitely get away with some extraneous movements um but i also think some of those things that you specifically talked about have associated costs with them right so if we use bodybuilders and powerlifters as an example generally if you measure any of them they have less available motion in general and so that could lead to them having some subclinical discomfort at a bulk of their times and i've worked with a lot of powerlifters and bodybuilders and i've seen that you had mentioned the forward head as as one thing now we say that posture and pain isn't correlated, but there is one thing that I have come across in the research where posture does matter, and it is actually your ability to breathe. And so there is some association with, um, in older subjects, with increased thoracic kyphosis or slouched positioning, um, having reduced lung volumes. And they've also shown too that forward head posture can um, influence airway resistance in the upper airway specifically. But I say that now to the people who are listening, that doesn't mean that the fix is to go the other way because just because you're in one posture doesn't mean that you can assume the exact opposite posture, right? Your body has to be able to move those fluids like that I talked about previously. And so what could possibly be going on, and unfortunately I don't have any um, longitudinal data on this, but I, like I said, I've worked with quite a few bodybuilders and powerlifters. Some of those issues could potentially be a way that that person is trying to keep their airway open over the long haul. Because if you work with anyone who's got a lot of neck musculature or increased neck girth, a large portion of them also have sleep apnea. And so if I shoot my head forward, what that does is that opens up the airway so they can breathe more easily. Now, they might not have any pain at all whatsoever, but you have to ask instead of like, oh gosh, why do I have this posture? I think a better question is, well, why is that posture that I'm expressing right now very useful? In the case of a bodybuilder or a powerlifter, a forward head might be the only way that they can keep their airway open because of the increased uh, neck girth. So there is that to think about. But at the same time too, they can get away with a lot of things that maybe the, the normal person can't. For example, like, you, you have a lot more uh, dietary leeway of things you can eat when you have a ton of muscle mass. And, um, you know, there's, there's always trade-offs with everything. And such a, and a great point. You opened up a big can of worms that I'm going to jump right into. But I, I do want to back off and think about uh, one thing else that you mentioned. When you were looking at po postural dysfunction, it always strikes me is that having, because the arguments are brought up a lot that 
Anterior pelvic tilt is not a problem because look at elite sprinters. And elite sprinters have tremendous amounts of anterior pelvic tilt. Yeah, but they also have spinal extensors that are like the size of a, of a bottle. I mean, they're huge. And comparing an elite athlete with an anterior pelvic tilt who's very strong and developed like that is to me not the same thing as Mr. or Mrs. Jones who's deconditioned with a lot of anterior pelvic tilt. It's not the pelvic tilt that it is, it's the circumstances that are surrounding why that individual might have a pelvic tilt. Now there's a lot of things I'm sure you could create a whole list of and why that's different, but to me that's fundamentally different having and being deconditioned and weak with certain types of postural issues and having conditioning and having that. It's happening for different reasons. Do you have any commentary on that? Yeah, I would agree with that. One, one is a, well, both of them are doing the same thing for each person. That is, they're allowing them to, in the case of anterior pelvic tilt, they're allowing them to put more force into the ground than if they didn't have that. But the reasons why are different. In the case of the sprinter, they're doing that so they can win the 100-meter dash. But in the case of the deconditioned person, they're doing that so they don't fall. And in that case, in the, in the latter case, that's a big problem. And so that person may benefit from learning strategies to have not only that as their go-to, to where they have increased um, you know, movement space to be able to utilize, but also to improving their fitness levels to um, so, so they don't have to default to that when they're just standing. Um, and, and so there's that person's got a lot more problems. Now it's not that the posture is the cause of this, but it is something that may have to be addressed. So that person has greater movement options available. So that way they're not loading areas focally, and then they can get more out of their fitness training to um, improve their conditioning. Yeah. And so I can already tell this is going to lead to multiple podcasts, but though the fun thing that I like to throw out there, which I find entertaining is the lack of standardization on how to actually deal with that. And so just for those of the listeners out there, we hear this like phrase that drives me crazy because there's, um, there's no criteria for which we determine when somebody has adequate core strength, because the idea is to correct anterior pelvic tilt, right? You need more abs, you need more glutes, you need more hamstrings. But what is that? Because nobody seems to know this. And for that person who's deconditioned, you know, sometimes a 60 second plank is, is going to be a big upgrade for their core strength. But the elite athlete, that's a joke. You know, you work with CrossFitters, high level athletes all the time. And what's what how do you determine or how one determines what a weak core is? So we have to kind of say well, this is far more complicated than that. Right. And that's going to depend, again, based upon that collection of items that we just discussed. They're doing it for different reasons. They have different needs. And certainly the uh, corrective actions, I know a lot of people don't like that that term, but what you're going to do to offset that is going to be different based on the person, right? Yeah, 100%. And, um, you know, I, I think one thing to think about too is, you know, in the case of a, a sprinter, an anterior pelvic tilt is probably beneficial to some degree. So then how do we, and, and it's clear that that person doesn't have a, a weakness issue, right? If you've, if you've seen no. any high level sprinters, <laughs> right, right. No, no. But what's probably more useful when it comes to uh, posture, if we're assuming that the issue is a lack of um, available movement option options is to find ways to measure what options that person does or doesn't have available. And hip, like in the case of anterior pelvic tilt, hip, hip range of motion is actually a useful way to look at that. If you look at how anterior pelvic tilt changes available motion, there was two studies done. One was in, I think, skiers, and then the other was in people who had uh, FAI, from acetabular impingement. And when they assumed a more anteriorly tilted position, there was a loss of flexion and internal rotation. And so if I take someone on a table and I measure their hip range of motion and we notice that there are some deficits, that is the better thing to test and improve upon than say the posture itself. So if I get someone who has, or, and I can, I can get them way more hip motion than they had prior, and maybe that changes how they look in standing, or maybe it doesn't, that's still a, a better thing to tackle than just say how someone looks on a plumb line. And that might yeah. be the one thing that we think about differently when it comes to something like anterior pelvic tilt specifically. Or in the case of the sprinter, 
you know, maybe we want to only give them enough motion so they can sprint to the highest level possible without experiencing pain, which could limit their training. And, and they might, each person is going to need an idiosyncratic or certain amount for themselves in order to reach their goals. And to follow a point on that, I would imagine with that pelvic tilt and a lack of hip flexion and internal rotation, I can imagine how that's going to look on the squat. And those of you, by the way, who have not looked at Zach's Instagram page, make sure you check this out because you still whole load and series on heels elevation and so forth and what that does to your squat because of the varying um, positions that the hips need to be in at different points in the squat. So that's, I mean, who, who doesn't see the value in increasing squat, even though we don't change their standing pelvic tilt angle, right? If the squat looks better, that's a, a pretty worthy outcome to go after, right? Yeah, I would agree. Okay. Or if they can go deeper than before. I guess a lot of times the people who have the significant anterior pelvic tilt and there's a loss of hip motion, oftentimes they can't squat all the way down. And so well, that's going to impact loading. That's going to impact like if, hey, my knees are uncomfortable when I squat. Well, the most compressive forces in the knee joint are at 90 degrees of knee flexion. And so if you can't get below that, which actually has less compressive forces, then that's a problem. So you got to do things to ensure that you can express the motions that you need to get the outcomes you want. And the uh, current obsession with glute training, right? And the, the irony there, I believe uh, gluteal recruitment is increased the deeper you go, right? I believe the largest EMG is maximal hip flexion in the squat specifically. And so if you can't get that, you're not going to get glute. There we go. So you say all that right there. And then there's the the funny part out of that. One is the primary muscle groups to correct anterior pelvic tilt. Oh, we need more glutes, right? So there we go. Let's go up the chain a little bit and let's talk about uh, the fluid dynamics and so forth. And just talking about the forward head posture and we're talking about what we collectively, I guess, would refer to, I call the upper quarter, which is kind of like the upper portion of the body. And you had mentioned the research on airway and so forth at head position. I do recall, and I don't know if there's a good amount of research, but at least a number of studies that looked at the relationship between um, neck curvature and head position and the position of the jaw. So we know that there's a relationship between these things, which totally makes sense with airway. But this goes into this uh, kind of realm that I spend a good amount of time dealing with, and I think a lot of people don't hear very much about, which is the relationship of things, for example, with the breathing, with the shoulders, with the neck and the jaw, because that can cause an entire, you know, Pandora's box of symptoms of people with neck pain, jaw issues, headaches, um, tinnitus, all sorts of things. So when we start to go kind of into that, let's talk about how breathing and the fluid dynamics can set somebody up for starting to have issues in the upper quarter. Um, and, and how do you see that going down? Everything in the upper quarter, uh, or a bulk of it, I should say, has to do with keeping the upper airway as pliable as possible so you can breathe. And so your body is going to assume whatever shape or, or posture it needs to in order to facilitate that action, especially during sleep. Um, and so if I, let's say, have a nasal obstruction or I have um, altered growth of the maxilla and the mandible of the face that's impacting the airway, your body may assume different positions to ensure that you breathe most effectively. And perhaps that re results in a loss of available movement options. And so if there's less movement options available, that could increase resting tension in tissues like some of the suboccipitals or other facial muscles, which you know, if then, then you're dealing with uh, ischemia or the loss of blood flow locally. So that can contribute to pain. Um, in terms of tinnitus, uh, the alteration of pressure in the mouth between like the, the nasal passages and the oral airway, well, that's going to influence the, the health of the eustachian tube. And maybe that's a contributing factor to tinnitus. And then that's most certainly going to Im influence vestibular function. So you have all of these issues that could be I always say it could be stemming from one thing, and that's in, in, or the need to ensure that you can breathe effectively over the course of the day. And so there's a lot of different strategies that one can use to help improve that 
which secondarily may lead to a reduction of stress in some of the areas that we've we've just talked about. Now, I've had a lot of experience with this personally in, in the things that start to be, because once I start to feel like I can make some improvements on something, it becomes an obsession with, hey, hey, maybe this is a contributing factor, which is I was taught all of the intricate neuromuscular therapy massage techniques for the craniofacial region. And so one of the things I'd, I'd have a lot of individuals over the year come to me with TMJ problems and again, tinnitus and headaches and migraines. And, you know, I was able to, to make some strong improvements with them just by doing massage work. Now, by no means was it a fix, but when you've got somebody with chronic migraines and the intensity and just how uh, stressful that is on their lives, and you can help to not necessarily reduce the intensity, right? Because those, when they hit, they hit, but oftentimes reducing the frequency and how long it takes to recover from them, that's immense. So it makes you think that, hey, there's got to be some kind of relationship between these things, even though I'm not by any means suggesting that these structural uh, or musculoskeletal issues cause those things, that they certainly somehow become intertwined so that when people are starting to have some kind of an issue, like an airway or whatever, they may develop neck pain. They may start having these other symptoms. And most of the professionals, I think we're all familiar with, you go see the doctor and they're an expert in what they are. You know, you see an ear, nose and throat specialist they're not going to be talking about any of the things that you are talking about. And I think one of the bigger challenges that I've experienced with is validating with, with some kind of testing to know whether this is, I mean, I think it's a bit more obvious if it's a, a pathological state where there's something diagnosable and dealing with some kind of subclinical issue. Like, I think we know that a lot of people don't breathe very well, but what are you going to use to test this? Because the breathing normal ranges, respiratory rate, respiratory volume are huge ranges. And most people, unless they're pathological, are going to fall within the norm. And so when I studied this for a bit, uh, I always say his name wrong, but Leon, Leon Scheitel, right, wrote the book Multidisciplinary Approaches to Breathing Dysfunction, talks about things like hyperventilation and where it makes total sense. I think a lot of clinicians don't like this topic because it seems so loose right? Have you come into this kind of issue with, with people and with uh, doctors and therapists? Uh, well, I think in my case, I, I have a, a bit of a niche practice and so I associate it with niche people. But um, yeah, it, it's always tough to figure out like, oh, my neck is doing this and it's related to breathing. So what are ways that I can measure that? One thing that does have a quite a bit of clinical utility would be a controlled pause. And most people I would say do not have, uh, are anywhere close to what we would deem a normal range. If you're, if you're familiar with some of Patrick McEwen's work. I'm not, um, but I'd love to hear what, what is a controlled pause? Yeah. So basically you would let out a nice, uh, you take one full breath cycle, not a complete exhale. Um, and then you would hold for, or hold your breath nose plugged for as long as you possibly could. And I believe the ideal number, and I, I, you'd have to check McEwen's work where he um, gets this from, but he's, he's done a lot of research in it, is about 45 seconds before you get, get the first hint of air hunger. Um, very few people get that far. I think that's a hard test. I can tell automatically. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I think probably tough. 20 seconds, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah. I've had some people where it's like five. Um, so, so that definitely has some clinical utility. I think, um, one other thing that I look at a lot, if we're talking about pathology related to airway is, um, encouraging people get sleep studies, um, because you can't, it's really tough to argue with the data on that. Um, I ask a lot of people, almost all my clients and patients, um, how well you sleep in? And I dive in deep on that. Like, are you getting your hours? Um, do you wake up in the middle of the night? Do you snore? Has someone told you that you snore? Do you ever gasp for air? Um, do you feel refreshed in the morning? Do you dream? Um, all of these things could uh, potentially be indicating that there is a sleep disorder that's underlying that is not being treated. And sleep studies can conveniently be done at home now. Um, I use the WatchPat one. That's the one that I have a lot of my patients try to do, and it's read by a sleep physician. Um, but I, the number of people who have caught who've had sleep apnea or upper airway resistance syndrome um, is is profound. And you, you know, people might be asking, well, Zach, what does that have to do with my neck pain and my headaches? Well, 
I did a bunch of research on the association between sleep and pain. And one of the studies that I read had stated, and this is very strong language in research, sleep disorders have a causal role in pain. It, meaning that if you have sleep trouble, you are more likely to have persistent pain. Your injuries are likely to last for longer periods of time. And the incidence of, of pain going from acute to chronic is, is quite a bit higher. And so it's, it's of the utmost importance that we encourage that our people have the capability of sleeping. And there's a lot of aggressive treatments that can be done. Um, but there's also a lot of conservative measures that can be utilized as well. And so whether that's, um, you know, doing some of the breathing exercises that we, we've been discussing, Sam, uh, but also uh, myofunctional therapy, which is essentially like physical therapy for the tongue, has been huge um, in that domain. Um, I've had some patients where they, um, a, a one woman in particular who stands out to me, who she uh, she's very muscular and she snores so loudly, like has hadn't slept in the same bed as her husband for a very long time. Everyone was saying like, you know, you snore so loud, had her doing some myofunctional based exercises, which is just different tongue postures, making sure the facial muscles can relax, working on chewing, swallowing, et cetera. And her snoring reduced by well over 50%, was able to have husband sleep in the room again, um, just, just from uh, targeting something like the tongue. So there's a lot of real estate that you can get from that. And so I think that's a really good measure that a lot of people aren't utilizing that could actually have more relationship to pain than we think. That's an important point. And so regardless, and, you know, regardless, if we're talking about low back pain, we're talking about sciatica, we're talking about any of that stuff is just improving people's sleep quality by getting them to basically be able to breathe better. And so I'm sure that there's a million things who so listen to these podcasts out here uh, that uh, all these neuroscience podcasts and so forth with all these all different types of techniques, right? My wife is a clinical nutritionist, so she would focus on this a lot with people with immune system problems and their nas nasal passages are inflamed and they can't breathe. There's a lot of information out there and a lot of uh, clients come to me who've seen dentists who are using, I mean, we're, I'm sure this is a definitely a conversation we're probably not gonna get to today, but you know, $10,000 oral appliances, just trying to move things around in their mouth so that they can sleep. And so I feel that that's quite a big jump from some of these simple conservative measures that one can do. And I, I can promise you that probably 99% of the people listening to this podcast have never even heard of myofunctional therapy. Um, so it's kind of one of those things where it was one of my questions for you that just seems to be an area that is not, uh, I was wondering, is the PT field at large aware of these kinds of, because I don't think a single client has come to me who's seen a PT for some kind of oral musculoskeletal work. Um, I know that there are myofunctional therapists, and in my opinion, correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of them end up being dental hygienists who are working alongside with a knowledgeable dentist who are actually implementing this in practice. Is that true? Yeah, it's usually either dental hygienists or you'll get some speech language pathologists who do similar things. Although I know a couple of physical therapy colleagues who dabble in this as well, aside from myself. Yeah, so it's it's an uncommon one or just an, an unknown one. So it seems to me that like in particular, and this is this is what I found one of the reasons I have you on here, of course, is that people have a resource. I get asked so many questions about this and saying that this is this is so complex and it's so overwhelming. Um, and I think people need to kind of know the scope of it, but when it comes back down to it, is working with a practitioner who actually knows how to assess these things. And to kind of essentially for, you know, better way to put it like a triage it, right? Try to figure out where somebody needs to start. And um, that's a space that you're obviously very comfortable with. Is that true? Yeah, for sure. You, you essentially, when you're dealing with, well, really someone who's dealing with health, health pain issues or performance issues, you need someone who's effectively a case manager who can kind of oversee the whole project, which is you, and pinpoint what are the biggest bottlenecks that need to be addressed, right? Some people may need to have some sort of aggressive sleep appliance um, or even surgery. Like I had a patient recent, recently <laughs> who had a surgery to correct her, her sleep apnea because it was pretty severe. Um, 
but you don't know that unless you have someone who can look at that person as a whole and pinpoint what are the best things to focus on. The overwhelming majority of people, I will say, do not exhaust conservative measures. Like, and, and I take that piece to be um, like way more than I, I, I feel most people would think about. Like when I say you've exhausted all conservative measures, like are you exercising regularly with a program tailored to you and your needs? Are you doing everything sleep hygiene wise that you can to ensure that you're getting adequate rest? Are you eating well? Not going to touch that, but just I think people know that there's some things that you probably don't need to be eating regularly. Um, you know, are you do you have a good social environment? Do you have social support? Um, are you doing good things to manage this stress? Are you? Yeah, I mean, basically, like just doing things that are needed to be a as healthy of a human as possible. If you do those things, it's going to lead to a lot of favorable improvements in your life. And worst case scenario, if you do end up needing an aggressive treatment, you're going to be so much better on the back end of that. You know, we had someone at uh, Elevate Sports Performance and Healthcare where I work who um, had his uh, fifth total knee revision because he had a lot of infections in the past. And he's been training for, I'd say, a year with us to prep for this last, hopefully, procedure. And I saw him postoperatively, and he's got almost all of the motion that you would expect after a total knee within two weeks was walking without an assistive device because he literally exhausted all the conservative measures that he could to ensure the best outcome. And that's really the most important thing that you can do when you don't know what to do for yourself, because we're all as providers operating with some degree of uncertainty. But if we can hammer these fundamental things that we need to be just healthy people, um, that will take you quite a bit far, regardless of what you end up needing. I think that uh, great. And um, the point that I want to, I'm trying to put all this into a concise statement. So we see so many, this dealing with health in general in, in all of these different areas is so much work and it takes so much time. Obviously we're dealing with that race against people's suffering, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, depending on how much pain they're in and so forth and how bad their symptoms are. There's just also trying to espouse like how important it is to do these things to have those successful outcomes. Like it's hard when somebody needs a surgery, like whether that's a micro discectomy or whatever, because their sciatic pain is so bad that they can barely even function. And saying, you know, if you do all of these things, that's you rapid, you probably significantly increase the chances you're, you're going to be better after that surgery. But they're in a race to get to the surgery or whatever. I'm just using that as an example. I can only imagine how many people have had, you know, uh, oral facial surgeries and so forth that like they didn't get the outcome that they want and it wasn't probably necessary. I'm just making an assumption here that it wasn't just that that wasn't effective, but maybe all of these other factors that they didn't take care of before they did that, right? Or that oral appliance that was like nine grand probably could have gotten so much more out of it had they done some of these other things. Um, I mean, it was a, that was a rambled mess there, but um, I think you know where I'm going with this. I, I really wish that people would exhaust those conservative measures because I, I really don't think sometimes they understand how important they really are, like having fitness before a knee replacement and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and this is slightly off topic, but not. I also think, too, um, just because you got a specific procedure, it's the same as physical therapy. Like, what I've learned in this upper airway space is not all practitioners and providers are created equal. And there's some people who do really good work, like amazing work with patients. And you can take another person who utilizes the same appliances or the same procedures or surgeries and does not do as well. And so another thing I would say that benefits people for exhausting all conservative measures is it affords you time to make sure you do your due diligence and research to make sure whoever you're working with or what you think you might need is done by the best person possible. Because once you change the anatomy, you can't unchange it. And you want to make sure you get it right the first time. So um, another reason to, to exhaust conservative measures to, is to, to delay that if you, if you can. I think one of the things that's exciting in that to help people, because that one is just such a, almost produces anxiety because yes, to hundred percent agree with that, but also finding those people. And I think that having resources like some of these institutes, like the Postural Restoration Institute, that's so 
s specific about the way that they look at everything in the mouth and so forth, the practitioners that they kind of have to some degree vetted, um, at least are gonna have people that are more integrative. Um, I've run across so many different professionals in these different realms and they don't integrate anywhere. They just operate on their own. They don't work with a PT, they don't work with anybody. So I'm a little bit more concerned about going with practitioners like that that aren't working in an integrated team because of this stuff being so complicated. Yeah, well, and you know, Sam, to be fair too, it's um, it's hard to find good people. Uh, it, you know, it's I'm not. This is not to talk smack about people in Las Vegas, but if you talk to anyone <laughs> where I live, I'm from Vegas, Vegas, by the way, so I understand. Oh, you are? Oh, Seriously? Yeah. yeah. Oh man, awesome. Yeah, it's a great place. I love it here. Um, I just moved here three years ago. But uh, well, then, you know, Sam, like it's hard to find good providers. Most of the people who live in town, if they're going to get something big, usually go to L.A. or mm -hmm. Arizona. And it's because there's unfortunately a deficit of of very good providers in this area. And, and there's some procedures where I'm like, ah, I think this person needs this, but you probably want to go to L.A. for it. You know, so um, it's it's tough. Like, it's really tough to find good providers. I mean, that's one reason, too, why. I do a lot of remote consultations for people is because even though I got a pretty good network and I'm going to try to default to if I got someone who I trust locally, I'm going to send to that. But that number is not large Yeah, uh, just because it takes it takes a lot to be good at what you do. And, um, you know, if everyone was if we had enough great people, then that would be the new average. And if you look at the average physical therapist, massage therapist, strength conditioning coach, um, it's not that great. So it's. It's really tough to find a good um, good people in one location, especially. Yeah, and you know, for years as I was doing YouTube videos, I think I call myself an early adopter on YouTube. Somewhere around 2008, I was making videos on anterior pelvic tilt, of course. So I look at back those; it's cringeworthy. But moving on, I would get so many calls, and people would say, "Hey, can I do a virtual consult with you, or can I fly out to see you?" And I'm like, "You're in New York. I'm in Los Angeles. Can't you find somebody locally?" I don't. You know, and and that was how hard it was, and this is still the case. It's it's better now because there's more information out there. But yeah, I mean, and over the years, I was like, it really is a big deal to hunt and travel to see the people that you need to see because you're going to end up, um, you know, it's it's going to cost you a lot more by not doing so. So um, what we'll do is we'll bring ourselves down to the home stretch here. I know that uh, again, I could have you on here for two hours, but I want to be respectful of your time. But let's talk about uh, again. I had mentioned your Instagram. Uh, page, which I think Instagram is now the thing, right? It's just so easy to quickly get visual content to digest it, but also, you know, to be able to follow up. So I see you got a lot of stuff on your Instagram page. What is your Instagram handle? I'll include it below on the video notes as well. But um, what is it? It's Zach, Z-A-C, couples, C-U-P-P-L-E-S. Okay, awesome. And you got a lot of movement work on there. Um, I think you have a free course too that you offer on your website, right? I do. Yeah. It's called enter the human matrix, which is basically like, if you're like, Oh wow, this, um, some of this fluid stuff sounds pretty cool. Or I have no idea about anything biomechanics wise. It's uh, a really good starting point. And if you want to take it to the next level and take my in-person seminar, human matrix, it is the precursor to that. So it'll help you make sure you get the most out of that. But yeah, I mean, I'm on all social medias. I got my own website, Zach couples, -E com. Um, so you can find me pretty much anywhere. If you're a practitioner, got to take the courses, make sure you read the website. There's just, the, you're going to be on it for a long time. I'm just going to promise you that, but well, well worth the time and the energy. All right. So those general pop people are out there who are listening to this. Um, and again, are probably highly motivated by the content you've had here and interested in consults and so forth. Is that something you offer as well? Yeah. Yeah. So I offer uh, remote consultations where basically if you have some movement issues and you're tired of doing me search and trying to figure out what you need because you've watched the fifth anterior pelvic tilt video and it's like, man, none of this stuff is helping. What do I do? Well, I can help you with that because I, I give very specific um, movements based on what, what movements you lack. Um, and I also offer remote training as well. So, if, you know, I, I think a lot of people can get by with just doing a few movements and feel pretty good. But as we talked about, you need to exhaust all conservative measures possible. And that's where doing uh, fitness training, 
that's built designed for you and uh, takes advantage of what movements you have available and shores up what you don't have available is critical. And so that's something I also offer as well. And then if you're in, uh, you know, if you need if you need this stuff in person and you're in Las Vegas, I work at Elevate Sports Forms and Healthcare. So, Zach, uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll do a follow up here because there's lots of great information. But uh, those of you, please check out his stuff. And uh, I want to thank everybody for watching. Zach, thank you so much for being here. And uh, we'll see you next time.